Hello again, everybody, and welcome to Block 7. Block 7, Manifest Destiny. Uh, and the first set of notes is simply called Texas. Texas is one of those states in the country that really evokes a lot of either very positive or a lot of very negative emotions in a lot of people. Either Texas is uh, the home of the Alamo and liberty-loving Americans and old-fashioned Americans and the frontier, or it's the home of a bunch of racist redneck hicks. Uh, and there's probably a little bit of truth in both of those statements. Texas is one of the most unique states in the entire country. It was its own independent country for nine years. It fought its own war of independence. It has its own national heroes. Um, Texas um, has a history and a story as big as the state itself. Um, and if you've never been there, I encourage you to go. It is a whole different world uh, in Texas. And as they say, don't mess with Texas. And if you do, you'll probably get a boot up your ass. Uh, so, how did Texas uh, come to be part of the United States of America? Uh, because it wasn't for a long time. And these notes have to start um, with President John Tyler. Tyler came to office uh, in a way that no president before him and only seven presidents after him ever came into office. Tyler came into office upon the death of the man who had been elected president, William Henry Harrison. And when Tyler... Uh, and there he is. Here, check this out. We're gonna. You can easily take the camera off and zoom in. There's, there's John Tyler. When John Tyler um, assumed the office, it was unclear whether he was going to. It's unclear how I get this freaking thing back in here. Also. There we go. When John Tyler assumed the office of president, it was unclear whether he was actually going to be the president or whether he was going to be some kind of acting president until they could have a new election in a few months uh, because the Constitution is not exactly clear on the subject. But Tyler said, I am the president. Um, I'm going to serve out um, President Harrison's term to the end of the four years, and then we'll go from there. And that was the argument that, um, that won out. Um, but it was a close-run thing for a little while, and, and Tyler kind of started out very unsure of his position. Now, Tyler was, Tyler was elected a Whig vice president, but um, he really didn't have very many Whig views. Um, and that's going to come back to haunt him, because one of the first things he did when Harrison died was he asked Harrison's entire cabinet to stay on as the Secretary of War and the Secretary of the Treasury and the Attorney General, etc. Um, he had appeared on Harrison's ticket to balance it geographically. Tyler was a states' rights southerner. I believe he was from Virginia. Uh, he did not appear, he, and he was used to balance the ticket so people in the South would vote for Whigs. He was not necessarily used um, because he ideologically agreed with everything Harrison did. In fact, he did not agree with very much of what the Whigs had to say. But when someone says, hey, would you like to be vice president? Tyler did what most of us would do and said yes. Uh, he was a Jeffersonian states' rights southerner. He was against the bank and internal improvements, uh, which made him not really a Whig. He was pro-slavery, and the Whigs were ambivalent on slavery at best. Um, and he also believed that the president should defer to Congress in the creation of policy, that Congress was the elected representatives of the people, and therefore Congress should be the leader in creating laws. Congress was led by its greatest Whig, Henry Clay. And Henry Clay said that he was going to pass a Whig program of laws, whether President Tyler, you know, w without really even asking President Tyler whether he agreed with it or not, that Henry Clay said, this man is a weak president, he was not elected to be president of the United States, I'm Henry Clay, everyone knows who I am, and the people voted for a Whig, and a Whig program they are going to get. So Henry Clay passed through Congress that, you know, included everything that the Whigs wanted. He ignored every one of Tyler's Southern views, and he ignored all of Tyler's states' rights views, and he passed 
or he tried to pass, or he had put into law, a very Whiggish program. Do, 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 do. Setting all this up. This bill gets put on President Tyler's desk, and he vetoes it. Uh, immediately. And after this bill was vetoed by the president, the entire cabinet, which had stayed on after Harrison's death, resigned. The rest of Tyler's term would be filled with domestic political controversy. Um, that the Democrats didn't want Tyler because he had run as a Whig, and the Whigs didn't want Tyler because he was more ideologically a Democrat. Um, and his term ended in 1844, and President Tyler did not seek re-election. President Tyler left behind something, though, in greater numbers than any other president in history, and that is children. I believe that President Tyler had 15 children uh, with two different wives. And since he fathered children when he was an older man in his 60s, and some of his children fathered children when they were older men, there, are, there is still at least one living, living grandchild of President Tyler, uh, who was president until 1845. He still has a living grandchild, which is kind of cool. Alright, so, the next thing we have to talk about, number two, is what's called the Webster-Ashburton Treaty. And I'm going to load this bad boy up. Webster-Ashburton Treaty. And we're going to find the map that's in your textbook. Here it is. Let's have a look at a full-size image. We will copy that. This is Charlotte's little book. We will go beyond that. We will paste that here. Come on, come on. Webster, oh, let's cut that out. Cut, 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 cut. Cut, 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 cut. You know, maybe next year I can have these things prepared. Crazy, that would be, wouldn't it? All right, let's take this bad boy off. Now, I talk, you listen. The only person that stayed on um, after Tyler's, after the entire cabinet resigned, was Daniel Webster, senator from Massachusetts. Um, and he, excuse me, uh, this, he was the Secretary of State from Massachusetts. He had been a senator, and now he was Secretary of State from Massachusetts. And he stayed on to negotiate this northeast border of the United States in between... Um, Maine and Canada. Um, you can see the three different lines. There's the little red line. That's the line that the British wanted. The British wanted the border of Maine to be at that red line. The big blue line is where the United States wanted the border to be. Um, and you see the kind of green line that goes and it runs along that river there. Um, that's the actual border of Maine. Both sides wanted the treaty to get done. Um, and only extremists on either side were interested in picking a fight over this. Uh, there's a famous story that during the negotiations for the Treaty of Paris in 1783, um, that Benjamin Franklin had drawn a map with um, a big red line on it that divided the United States from Canada. And Franklin's line made it seem as if the United States got the bigger chunk, the blue line, that Franklin's original line was in blue. But nobody could find that map. That map was missing somewhere. But everyone knew it was somewhere. But no one quite knew where Franklin had that line drawn all the way back in 1783. The British would not accept the line where the blue border is, because that would leave too skinny of a section between New Brunswick and Quebec. They needed enough room to build a road from New Brunswick to, uh, to, uh, to Quebec. So, um, Secretary of State uh, Webster got himself an old-looking map, got himself the equivalent of a big red magic marker, and drew a red line right where the British wanted, right all the way right down the middle of Maine. And he said to the other Americans, look, before the British get their hands on this map, we had better negotiate a treaty in the middle or they're going to insist on the whole thing. Uh, so the Americans did. And a very fair treaty line was drawn um, between the United States and Canada here in the north, very northeast part of the country. 
after the treaty had been signed and everybody was happy, um, it turned out that Franklin's line was actually uh, all the way up in the blue. The British had that map, but they obviously weren't telling the Americans. Um, but in the end, uh, good sense and common sense won out, uh, not only in Maine, but over here in um, Minnesota, that the, um, the northern border of Minnesota up near Lake Superior was drawn. The United States... The United States and Great Britain, in the 1840s, oops, I don't know what that is. The United States and Great Britain in the 1840s uh, were growing very dependent on each other. The United States was dependent on Great Britain for capital, and, the, and Great Britain was growing very dependent on the United States for food. Um, so neither side had an interest in a conflict over something as silly um, as the northeast border of Maine. Let us move to number three, Texas. Texas. All right. The adams onis or Transcontinental Treaty of 1819, clearly drew the border of the United States and the Spanish colony of New Spain, excluding Texas. And you can see on your map, um, on your notes, the adams onis Treaty Line of 1819 clearly divides the United States from New Spain and gives Texas to New Spain. However, lines on maps from the colonial period, have very, very rarely stopped American settlers. And by 1821, American settlers led by Stephen Austin, uh, for whom the capital of Texas, Austin, Texas, is named, had begun to settle in Texas, which technically belonged to Spain. Spain, in the, 18, uh, the decade of the 1800s, the 1810s, was, an, was a much weakened country. All of its Latin American colonies had been fighting for and declaring their independence, including Mexico. Uh, Mexico had been fighting for its independence from Spain since 1810, and by 1821 the Spanish crown agreed to recognize Mexico as a separate and equal state. Uh, but because uh, during this conflict, during the Mexican War for Independence, neither Spain or the Mexicans could do anything about these Americans just moving into uh, Texas. They were concerned with fighting around the more populous areas of Mexico, down by Mexico City and in the central and southern parts of the country. Um, so there was nothing to stop uh, these American settlers. And Texas is really, really, it's a big fat prize, really. Cotton flourished on the plains of Texas. Um, so Americans, especially from the South, came, and most of them, or many of them at least, brought their slaves. At first, Mexico welcomed these settlers. They offered them free land and free local government. They thought that, you know, a powerful and populous and wealthy Texas could only help Mexico. But American settlers, although they were technically living in the independent nation-state of Mexico, felt absolutely zero loyalty to the Mexican state. Mexican law... Uh, in the 1820s, there was no freedom of religion in Mexico. Mexicans were Catholic. Catholicism was the official religion of Mexico. And all immigrants into Mexico, according to Mexican law, had to be Catholic. Mexican law, all immigrants have to be Catholic. All the Americans were Protestants. Mexican law demanded that all Mexican immigrants, people who come into Mexico, must speak Spanish. The settlers knew so, no Spanish. Mexican law outlawed slavery. The American settlers brought in their slaves. And in, court, and in order to be in accordance with the letter of the law, they freed, freed their slaves and then signed them to lifetime contracts of indentured servitude that they could not get out of. So in 1830, the Mexicans got sick of this flood of people coming into Mexico from the United States, and what did you know, they banned, cut off, immigration to Mexico from the United States. That stopped nobody. By 1830, um, the settlers kept... That stopped nobody because there was nothing the Mexicans could do to stop them. Um, 
the Mexicans could not afford to dispatch this giant army to a very sparsely populated northern province. Uh, so in the absence of any effective uh, way to enforce the law, the Americans just ignored the law, um, as we have been doing for many, 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 many years. By 1830, there are 20,000 Americans and about 2,000 slaves in Mexico. Compare that to only a few thousand native-born Mexicans. Mexico, excuse me, Texas, I'm saying Mexico, Texas. By 1830, there are 20,000 Americans in Texas with about 2,000 slaves and only a few thousand native-born Mexicans. The northernmost province of the nation-state of Mexico was an overwhelmingly American area. That is not a recipe for success. There were some offers to buy Texas on account of the American government. In the mid-1820s, President John Quincy Adams offered to buy Texas for a million dollars. In the late 1820s, a few years after, President Jackson offered five million. On both occasions, uh, Mexico refused. So you have this Texan community in northern Mexico who feels zero loyalty to the Mexican state. They are American Southerners for the most part. So it came time where the settlers in Texas decided they really wanted nothing to do uh, with the Mexican government. And so uh, what you get is letter E on your notes, the Texas War for independence, which is something that all people in Texas are very, very proud of. They don't not only have the American Revolution uh, with its heroes and its stories and its battles and its glories, they also have their own Texas War for Independence. In the middle of the 1830s, Mexico decided that it was going to once and for all enforce its policies on the American population in Texas. And when the Mexican authorities came up into Texas and said, you actually have to listen to the laws now, the American-born the American born population of Texas said, try us, pretty much. And they started a revolt with a with the aim of independence from Mexico. Now, the Texans were American Southerners. They assumed that once they were free from Mexico, they would become part of the United States. That was their goal. They wanted to split off from Mexico and then glomp... glomp on to the United States. And with stories of possibilities of glory and battle and, you know, all things like that that have attracted young men to battlefields for thousands and thousands of years, thousands of American volunteers looking for, you know, adventure, looking for something to do, looking for a way to get away from the monotony of the farm, flocked to Texas to help the rebels. And you get, at the beginning of this war, one of the great stories um, of American history, one of the great stories of Texan history, one of the great battles of American history, number three, the Alamo. And the story of the Alamo starts in 1836. The president of Mexico, um, who is known to history simply as Santa Ana, Santa Ana marched north with an army of 6,000 intending to take this rebellion of American settlers and crush it. He reached uh, the town, and today the city, of San Antonio in February of 1836. In the town of San Antonio was a small force of 187 Texans, led by Colonel William B. Travis. They were holding this city, 187 men, against 6,000 men of the Mexican army. And because 187 men cannot possibly hold off a force of 6,000 on open ground, they retreated into an old mission fort known as the Alamo. And the story goes that Colonel Travis drew a line, and had his men lined up, all 187 of them, and he drew a line in the sand, and he said, anyone who wishes to leave step over this line and we'll let you go. And the story goes that about one person stepped over the line. That the rest of them said, we'll sit here and we will fight and we will defend uh, San Antonio and the Alamo against Mexican attack. And they took refuge in this mission uh, and the church of the old mission. 
Santa, uh, uh, Santa Ana attacked this small force, expecting to annihilate it quickly. He outnumbered them 6,000 to 187. But for 10 days, the Texans in the Alamo beat back uh, the assaults, and they inflicted terrible casualties on the attackers. Um, that they, you know, built new walls and placed cannon, and it was a it was a last stand, and culturally, we love the idea of a last stand. That's why we love that movie 300 with the Spartans, and um, we love a story of a last stand. It's, it's, there's, there's a lot of romanticism to it. Uh, finally, though, military reality took over, and on March the 6th, with the uh, defenses terribly weakened, the Mexicans assaulted the fort and breached the walls, and then any survivors that they found inside were killed, including the legendary Davy Crockett. If you were American children growing up 50 or 60 years ago, all of you would need, Davy Crockett would need no introduction from me to you. Let's have a picture of good old Davy Crockett up here. I'm sure, I, I'm not, not that I'm sure, I don't know. I am confident that when you see a picture of Davy Crockett, you will know who this is. Here he is, king of the, whoops, wrong one, beep, news line. We're going to put him up here. Like I said, if this was 1952 and not 2012, not a soul amongst you would need any introduction for who this is. Wink. That's Davy Crockett, and as the television theme song went, King of the Wild Frontier, that he was the, uh, the subject of one of the most popular uh, children's television shows in the history of American television. Uh, boys throughout the 1950s all were wearing those coonskin caps. If you were not wearing one of those coonskin caps, you were just not cool, and nobody would really talk to you. He was a, uh, a pioneer and a settler and an all-around interesting guy. Um, and he was one of those people that went to the Alamo for, you know, the adventure of it and the story of it. Um, and he was, uh, now, uh, he was killed uh, at the end of the battle. There are two stories for Crockett's death, uh, both worth talking about, because history is about individuals when you get down to it. Um, we don't know which story is true. Both have some evidence pointing to it. Um, but neither, neither side of the evidence is so good that we can rule out the other. First, uh, the original story went that his body was sur found surrounded by two pistols, 16 dead Mexican soldiers, and one of them had his knife in him, implying, of course, that Crockett single-handedly fought off 16 Mexican soldiers until his guns were out of ammunition and he used his knife in his last glorious defense of himself and he was killed. The other story about Crockett's death uh, was he was knocked unconscious and captured at the end of the battle and then executed on the orders of Santa Ana. Both stories serve a purpose. If you really want to make Santa Ana look bad and make Americans really dislike the Mexican government, you go with the story that Santa Ana killed him. If you want the story that Davy Crockett went down fighting, you go with the first story. We simply don't know. The other person of uh, fame that died at the battle was David Bowie, who invented the Bowie knife. Um, which again, if you were growing up in a less Oprah-fied time, you would all know what this is. That's a Bowie knife. I'm sure you've seen it before. With that curved blade and that little cutoff over there and the hilt. That was invented by David Bowie, a Kentuckian who was also present at the battle. Regardless of the details, the defenders were all killed. All 187 of them died. But their death inspired the Texan army. A few weeks after, on March the 6th, no, excuse me, that day, the day the Alamo fell, Texas formally declared its independence. So this Mexican army had been victorious at uh, the Alamo, but it had been seriously weakened. A Texan army under the command of General Sam Houston, as in 
Houston, Texas, under General Sam Houston, surprised and routed Santa Ana's army at the Battle of San Jacinto. And if I'm screwing up the Spanish, I apologize, you can correct me in class, okay? That's my fault. I should have taken six years of Spanish instead of six years of French. So, I apologize for the terrible Spanish. It's good enough to order at Taco Bell, uh, but not really much more than that. My apologies. Uh, but at this battle of San Jacinto, that was probably worse, um, the, the Texan, the, excuse me, the Mexican force was routed, and the next day Santa Ana himself was captured by Texan forces. The Mexican army retreated beyond the Rio Grande, leaving Texas completely free of Mexican troops. In September of that year, Sam Houston was elected president of the Republic of Texas, and the Lone Star flag was raised in freedom over the Texas State House. In October, the people of Texas voted, um, the vast majority of Texas residents voted to become part of the United States. Um, they wanted to be annexed by the United States. That word annex is a word that's going to come up often. To If one country annexes another, it means a country takes another country and makes it part of their own. Most of the time, people do not want to be annexed. Um, but in this case, the Texans did wish to be annexed by the United States and become part of the United States and become a state in the United States. What's better than having a good old picture of the Texas flag. The flag of Texas today is the same flag that they used um, when they were an independent country, and they were an independent country after the Texas War of Independence. By 1836, there's over a hundred, excuse me, there's over 10,000, um, by 1836, there's 10,000 Americans in Texas. By 1845, there's over a hundred thousand. So the Texans say to the United States, hey! Annex us! We'd like to be Americans. And President Jackson, in one of his more um, thoughtful um, maneuvers, hesitated. Annexing Texas, in Jackson's opinion, he was probably right, might mean war with Mexico. The United States was not prepared for war with Mexico. Um, Jackson is a Jeffersonian. He has a limited military. The American military is not ready to fight Mexico. Uh, the American military is small. It is unprepared. President Jackson is not willing to commit the United States to a war with Mexico. The American military is designed to fight Indians, not the soldiers of another nation state. Texas was also a slave state, and President Jackson, although he owned slaves and was a Southerner, knew that nothing divided Americans like the slavery question. And Jackson said, I don't want to bring slavery back up as an issue. So he just kind of let sleeping dogs lie. And Texas went along its way as an independent country. It developed friendly ties with Great Britain, it did not have a tariff, so that um, Texan cotton was cheaper than Southern cotton. So Texas, although it wanted to be part of the United States, did perfectly fine as an independent state. But the fact that it was doing so well really scared the South, because they're selling their cotton for cheaper than the South can sell theirs. So President Tyler, by the time the 1840s roll around, this happened during um, the end of Jackson and the beginning of Martin, and, and the beginning of Martin Van Buren's um, presidency. By 1844, when President Tyler is in office, Tyler being a Southerner, Tyler wanted to settle this issue once and for all. So in 1844, his last year in office, President Tyler gets his Secretary of State, a man by the name of Abel P. Upshur, Secretary Upshur, negotiated a treaty of annexation. 
most Americans supported this treaty. Even the anti-slavery North was brought around to support this treaty that would bring a new slave state into the Union. They were nationalists. They said, woohoo, the United States is gaining this huge, rich, vast territory, and we're going to put another star up in the flag, and we're all going to, you know, be proud to be Americans. Upshur, the Secretary of State, figured that the Senate would have enough votes to pass the treaty. All treaties in the Senate have to be approved by a two-thirds majority. So Upshur kind of counted snouts in the Senate and said, I've got my two-thirds votes. Upshur, in planning this thing, uh, this treaty, this vote, uh, went aboard a naval ship to kind of view uh, a demonstration, and the demonstration went horribly wrong, and a gun exploded, and it killed him. Uh, so Upshur was dead. And his treaty kind of hung in the balance. President Tyler screwed up the next move. President Tyler appointed John C. Calhoun, and we all know who Calhoun is, he appointed Calhoun as Secretary of State and said to Calhoun, push this treaty through Congress. And at that point, the North said, whoa, Calhoun? Like, nullification, South Carolina, slavery, Calhoun? Oh, no. Oh, no. Can't have this treaty. Calhoun, by 1844, is so associated with the South and nullification and slavery and the threat of disunion that the North comes to believe that Texas is being annexed only to spread slavery and only to spread the Southern point of view in the United States. So the North turns against the treaty. And then all the politics, it's, eight, it's the summer, summer and early fall of 1844. There's an election coming. No, no senator in the North wants to be the guy who votes to expand the slave power. So with this election looming, and with Calhoun's fingerprints on it now, the Senate voted to reject the treaty overwhelmingly, 35 to 16. So with no treaty of annexation, Texas remained a free republic. That really kind of pissed off the Texans who wanted to be a part of the United States. But without this treaty going through the Senate, there was no way that Texas would be annexed in 1844. And Texans would have to wait until things heated up between the United States and Mexico, and they would also have to wait for a new president to make their next move. Throughout the summer of 1844, with the election looming, Democratic candidate James K. Polk has, is running for president on a platform of, yes, we should annex Texas. And we will see later on in the block whether Polk won and how the United States came to own the great Lone Star State, the state of Texas. One of three states in the United States to be independent republics, um, extra credit to the first kid who comes to me with the other two. Have a wonderful, wonderful night. And as they say in Texas, God bless Texas.